line on both of them. Okay, uh, so that, to me that, let me see if I get this right. So like if I just take our geometry and I pick out two random points, um, then I know that there's one line that contains both of those points and it must also contain a third point because that's what a line is. But I also know that there, there aren't multiple lines that contain those two points. There's only one, there's exactly one. Well, yes. So if I pick out like points A and B, then I know there's one line that contains like A, B and, and some other point, like maybe we'll just call it C, but then there's not another, there's not a line that's like A, B, D, because it says for each two points, A and B, there's exactly one line. Um, okay, and then finally five, each two lines have at least one point that's on both of them. Oh, wow, okay, so like, any two lines have an intersection point. That seems cool. This, is a, uh, this yeah. is a cool thing to think about. And from those axioms, you actually uh, determine that that is the minimum Fano geometry. Oh, the, oh, wow. Okay. So we got ourselves all the way up to saying there must be at least four points, except uh, we didn't get all the way to this. It looks like apparently there must be at least seven points. Yeah, there must be at least seven points and seven lines. This one you're showing on the screen now is the minimum, not just an example. Well, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it, it's an example. But it is, a, it's both a minimum and a maximum. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. So let's. But let's, anyway, let's, this this sure. little short video developing a model for Fano's geometry, he goes through exactly what you were doing, you know. But at each step, he 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 draws the fourth point, and then he says, "Well, there must be a line," and this thing sort of develops itself naturally from. Um, from from those axioms, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what Greg did in the video was he encoded the geometry in our calculus. Okay, cool. In in the space time calculus or a new a variant in the, of in the in the row calculus or a pi calculus. Oh wow! Okay. Okay, so, and, and the question I brought up in the channel, so, so if our calculus is encoded as a geometry, the Kano plane, what does the geometry of the Kano plane tell us about our machine? And then I go on to say, or is it also the fact that we can now reason about our machine in the manner of a finite geometry? Oh. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So how do we, so... Um, I have like a, a big beginning that a little bit. between P8 and every other point in the geometry. And then because we did that, uh, you know, those lines all have to have a third point. Yeah. Oh, that would, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Hi, Isaac. Hi, Tomislav. How's it going, Jashi? Hi, hello. Gary was just blowing my mind with, uh, with Fano's geometry. I was just, <laughs> I've never seen it before. Have you guys seen it? No, 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 that's something Greg, Greg was talking about. <laughs> uh, I've only seen infinite projective geometries before. Ooh. You've only seen infinite projective geometry. Yeah, if, if you can imagine infinite projective geometries are easier than finite projective geometries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Fano's geometry is an example of a finite projective geometry? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So does does finite mean like uh, the the set of points are finite, or what's finite about yes. it? Yes, the oh, points okay. and lines are are finite. So it's like, a, is it like a dis, the finite versus infinite? It's almost so far in my like twenty seconds of having thought about it. It seems like a discrete versus continuous kind of exactly, distinct. and and yeah. that's what Greg brought up brought up in the Casper video that what. You know, our, our machine can move out of, of states where it is a geometry and, and then move back into new states where it's new geometry. So he yeah. talks about continuous geometry. I mean, you know, I went from thinking basically before the video that there is what, like one geometry, right? <laughs> but, but, <laughs> now, but, but now we're talking about a continuum of geometry. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we we have a continuum of uh, hyperbolic geometries. I mean, and it, whatever whatever you want, basically, if you can define a metric, then uh, you got a different geometry. Yeah. But anyway, it, it it totally blew my mind. I've been I've been studying uh, you know finite geometry since Monday. You know, that that's all I can think about right now, and a projective geom a projective geometry. So, um, did you understand, or maybe any, anybody can answer this, really, uh, that's watched the video from the Casper stand-up. So, what was the connection between the processes that he had? He, he said, you know, all of the points were red X's and the lines were terms. And uh, I didn't understand where he got the expressions, the, the red X's, uh, for each of the points. So, so hey, I everybody fixed that out. Question. This is a basic question that I think you'll be able to answer. What it, remind me exactly what a red X is? I know it stands for reduction expression, but is it like the yeah. the set of like a bunch of terms that can themselves reduce, or is it like the the whole thing that says like these terms arrow some other terms? Or? Yeah. So I think a red X is just an expression that has possible reductions. So like sends and uh, receives in parallel with one another, um, okay. which which was another question that I had because none of the expressions that he was representing the points with were reduction expressions. They were all like uh, choices essentially. Yeah. Cool. So what is a uh, what's the <laughs> what's a projective geometry? What's the projective part mean? Oh, here's the encoding. Oh, it looks like it's cut off though. Uh, so the project, so I'm not 100% sure why it's called projective. I can give you like a, a speculative colloquial reason why I think it might be called projective. Yeah. Uh, so the, the easiest example of a projective geometry is if you were to take, say, like the Euclidean plane, like the plane that you're very familiar with, uh, there's a way to do a projection onto the surface of a sphere uh, in such a way where you miss one point. Um, and, you know, you preserve like the equator of the sphere is basically just the, um, the unit circle and, and like all of these other nice things. It's called a stereographic projection. Um, and this projection has really nice properties. It uh, preserves angles and orientation. Uh, it's what you call conformal. And um, so you're missing this one point and then you can basically add this one point and you consider it a point at infinity. Uh, they call it an ideal point. And um, you get this weird phenomenon where all of your lines in the plane now correspond to circles on the, the uh, surface of the sphere. Except it's a true line if the circle intersects this one point at infinity. Okay. Yeah. So now, all of your lines in the plane now correspond to circles who go through the, the point at infinity. Circles still correspond to circles. Uh, you know, if you have just like a, a regular circle that doesn't go through the point at infinity, that's fine. It still corresponds to a circle on the, on the surface of the sphere. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. Linear space. Any line has at least two. Points. Whoa, 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 wait. This sounds like a different thing than what we, those axioms we read. Uh, 
Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. They don't have any. Okay, the next. Okay, the, the, the second, the next one has the same axioms. I don't think they've specified, specified the method here. A set of technical terms that are chosen as undefined and are subject to the interpretation of the reader. All other technical terms are defined by means of the undefined. Oh, dealing with undefined terms and definitions that are chosen to remain unproven. Okay. That's weird. I don't get it. <laughs> Okay, so a finite geometry. Okay, so finite, I guess it says there exists at least one line. Not all points are on the same line. Each pair of points and lines is at most on one line and lines and points. Each pair of points and lines is at most on one lines and points. The number of finite points and lines, number of points and lines is finite. Nice. All right. Yeah. So this one says, I guess this one says like linear space, any line has at least two points. And then I, I remember in the, the axioms of Fano's geometry, it said every line has exactly three points, right. which is more specific but still compatible two points are on precisely one line oh yeah that was in uh that was in the the axioms we looked at earlier too yeah so i mean it's like an abstraction from euclidean geometry right like you need two points to define a line uniquely Yeah, so this is the same figure that I think that Gary had showed with just that that circle is completed instead of just being more like U-shaped. And the these lines, these, these li instead of the lines being three points, they're two points, right? Uh, no, those lines all have three points. Well, but they're... They, Um, so, so you can draw, th okay, you can consider, e you consider each, each two point line to be independent, right? I, I think that Craig was talking about uh, that each line has three points. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have three point lines, you have one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Wait. Yes. Uh, seven. I don't know. That's it. Okay, but if, if each line has two points, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Oh, I lost count. But um, uh, there is a line. There is a. This is constructed of lines that obey the rules, right? Oh, at least two points. So it could have more than two. Uh. Yeah. So, so I think uh, is this this uh, little Venn diagram on slide nine. Um, that seems like it's describing something more general than the the Fano geometry. Does that seem right? Oh, you're stuck. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah the, the Fano geometry is just one of an infinite, uh, you know, set of geometries. But the Fano mm -hmm. geometry is quite interesting. Yeah, the fa the fan fa fa Fano plane looks like. Oh, these are the same five that Gary showed her. 
Right. Any two distinct lines are intersection on exactly one point. Okay. Exactly. Oh, this. Oh, wow. There's only one valid way to do this Fano geometry, and it's that one that we just saw. Hmm. I, I believe like, so, but there there are some subtleties to that question. I, I I'm that may be a. a Ooh. Suppose a switch can only connect up to three numbers and seven numbers need to be connected. How many switches are required so that any number can call up any other number? So these are equivalent diagrams, or what? Uh, it seems like they're equivalent in some sense, at least. Like we have that blue line that goes from four, five, seven in both diagrams. Yeah, I haven't found any discrepancies. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard them say, that all, all Thano geometries are isomorphic. Ah, okay. So the way in the wording of this little like problem here, it says how many switches are required so that any number can call up any other number. Does call up mean like um, if one wants to call up six, then it could like uh, call up seven and seven could relay to six? Um, I don't think it can. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, that you just don't have two that are disconnected from one another. Hmm. I, I mean, I guess I don't know. That's how I'm interpreting it. I'm not really sure. They uh, yeah. that must be one of those undefined things they were talking about at the beginning. How many switches are required? And that would call up any other number. Huh? If that is what call up means, it seems like we could get rid of some of those switches. And well, this four here has one, two, three, four, five, six. Wait. Yeah, three. It's connected to six different numbers. Oh, yeah, 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 right. Okay, whereas four here is only connected, well, what does this mean here? Is connected it possible three to three and six? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it okay to be connected to more than three lines? Uh, I see somewhere it's written that. Oh. I think I I I, I read that uh, it must be three lines in each point, or am I missing something? Um. Yeah. Good question, Tomislav. I don't think having additional lines go through the point violates the axioms any axiom directly, but it might just be that it's like, if you try to do that, then it's impossible to satisfy some of the other axioms or something. Oh, that looks cool. Oh, yeah. I gotta get that. So the big board is this Fano plane and each one of those little ones at each one of the points is another Fano plane. Yeah, nested Fano planes. It's a tensor product of Fano planes. <laughs> the Fano plane of Fano planes. Huh? If I buy seven of those in a sheet of plywood, could I make a one that has one more degree of recursion? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. We have to we can put, see if we can play that, huh? Gotta be an online version, right? Yeah. Oh. Um, oh. Oh, 
points and lines are vertices of the second graph. Cool. Can be represented as queens on chessboard. Oh, wow. Wait, how do you, it doesn't say what the win condition is. Three in a row. Oh, oh, okay. Occupy all three points on, oh yeah, duh, same as always. Okay, I get it. <laughs> tic tac fano. <laughs> can, can Xavier lose the game? <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, interesting no. question. Like, even if he intentionally plays a poor strategy. Um, or does the first player who goes always win? It seems like I, I read that second paragraph as like, if Xavier, the first player, like does his best and like doesn't make mistakes, then he always wins. No. But I don't know. If Oh, I think win, winning strategy is like no matter what the other player does, you win. <laughs> oh, really? I think so. Oh, nice. Yeah, I don't see how he how he can lose. <laughs> well, uh, so isn't it the case that if you were to put three X's down, you win? Because three X's determine a line and so then you have no matter right. where you put them, you have three x's on a on a line is that true um, no because if you put them all around the outside that doesn't yeah. determine determine uh, what yeah but if you're the first player to go even if you put all three on the outside you still have one more and wherever you put that one you win what if uh okay let's say that that x goes first and x places x's strategy is going to be like occupy the three outer corners of like the largest triangle we see there yeah and then yeah, oh yeah. yeah those three and then o's strategy is to go on the three um like there's actually an o on that bottom center one and then also the other two that are kind of like in the middles of the outside yeah that one yeah yeah so i think so would win in that case yeah is it counts that you have this circle also as a like I, yeah i would think the circle, the circle is, is a line yeah the circle is a line <laughs> all right okay so we get the, the game line. of nim <laughs> it's not the case that any three points forms a line. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I I uh, I I missed that obvious case of the yeah. three corners. Yeah. It's not on a line. Yeah. Silly me. I sort of missed the whole point of the spano plane. Yeah, so how did, how, what was the relationship between this and like process calculi? For me, it, it was like interesting that uh, you can have this uh, dynamic geometry. So you can go from one to another. Right. Yeah, so how does that work? Hmm. Or what does it mean exactly? So like, if I have a geometry to go to another one? I, I think that yeah. question is, is 
possibly the most interesting question, but I don't think the there that we have an answer to it yet. Because I'm not sure what it even means to encode our calculus as a final play. Yeah. Yeah, and Greg, Greg was talking about in relation to to like uh, the scattering amplitudes. So I'm wondering what what, <laughs> what is what is this exactly? You know, and how how this relates to to like this dynamic geometry. It's miraculously evolving geometries. It was uh, what we're supposed to see here. Miraculously evolving geometries. Yeah, that was uh, something he offered in the spirit of Christmas where uh, uh, collections of lines and points detach from the geometry and you know the the question he posed was you know what happens you know they they sort of disappear to the the calculus but they, you know he also posed the question what happens when they reappear you know what happens when they reattach and form a new geometry and, and that's what he called you know a a true Christmas miracle. <laughs> Was this math or church? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Yeah. 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 Um, so if he's calling this a dynamic geometry, does that mean that it comes from dynamical systems somehow? Can you say what does it mean, dynamical system? Uh, so like, for example, the Mandelbrot set is uh, associated with a particular dynamical system. And a dynamical system is basically just some sort of mapping that is iterated uh, ad infinitum. Hmm. And so like the Mandelbrot set is uh, the set of points under a particular mapping it's like z to z squared plus c or something uh z being a complex number and uh it, it, so it's the set of points under you know iterations of that mapping that stay bounded mm. so evolution of Mandelbrot set is like changing geometry of, or in some sense, or? So, uh, so to determine if a point is in the Mandelbrot set or not, you would run this uh, mapping Z goes to Z squared plus C uh, with that, that point, you know, a, a coordinate of like a real number in a complex, uh, a real number, you know, the, the real part and the imaginary part. Uh, so you would do that mapping from Z to Z squared plus C and then see if this thing is bounded or if it's unbounded, right? Like if uh, it grows, you know, unboundedly far away from the origin. Uh, so, uh, and then that would, that would tell you whether or not a single point is in the Mandelbrot set. But you are always looking at the same, like, same geometry when you, you when you, when you decide, is it bounded or not, right? Or um, I'm I'm not sure I understand the question. So like, uh, so you you just pick any point you want from the complex plane, and then uh, just iterate that mapping with that as the input, and then you see if if this thing remains bounded or if it uh, you know just keeps getting further and further away from the origin. I, I mean, I'm imagining like uh, Euclidean geometry when you say oh it's bounded or, or not it's you know yeah you, you have an origin and uh, x and y and you say oh yeah. th this line goes you know 
uh, outside. But yeah. can you have like some kind of curved geometry when this line in will be unbounded in the Euclidean space, but you know, in this, is this some strange geometry you, you can say, oh, but it's bounded. Um, well, so that's, that's the thing about projective geometries is that, uh, so you add this point at infinity and now your space becomes compact in the sense that uh, well, topologically compact. So like every every open cover has a finite open sub cover uh, is compactness. And so like in um, so in a sense that is a, a bounded thing. But somehow you know you took something unbounded, you added a point, and now it's bounded. But it's because the topology changes. You're not using the same notion of like what constitutes an open set anymore. Yeah. I mean, is this the like dynamic geometry when you change, uh, you know, from, from final plane, you, you, you go to Euclidean uh, plane? Mm -hmm. like, like go to, do you mean like map the points onto? Well, like for every point in the Fano plane, there's a corresponding point in, oh, onto wouldn't yeah, even be. I'm not, word, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. How can you change? <laughs> I mean, you, you have this, uh, some points and then you go somehow. Yeah. And then this is the magical, magical part that Greg mentioned. You know? Yeah. So you somehow go to, to different geometry and then and, and, and you can go to different, like different thing that is uh, not geometrical at all. And then you can go back. So yeah, I, I wasn't sure what you meant by it being compositional. What does it mean for a geometry to be compositional? Hmm. Yeah. So I, I definitely understand the mapping that Isaac described earlier, where you take the plane, like I almost, and map it onto the surface of a sphere. Like I almost think yeah. of a piece of like paper just representing, you know, it's finite, yeah. obviously, but like just representing the, the plane. And then if maybe it's not paper, but like stretchy or like, I don't know, Play Doh y yeah. or something, then I can like take it and like roll it up, squishing all of it down you know like the parts here by my palms at the south pole of my sphere are not getting messed up that much but like my finger parts they're getting really compacted and jammed closer together but i don't really know like i even that makes sense intuitively because of like there's this hmm, i don't even know what the right word is like continuous is is coming to mind i guess or like adjacent like the i know when there's infinitely many points you can't really talk about like this guy's my next door neighbor but like it almost seems like the same points are still adjacent to each other or something. But like with this Fano plane, there's only seven points and our lines didn't even have to be like, you know, straight in any notion that like really makes sense in my brain. So I'm just thinking like, sure, I can project that on anything you want. I'll just draw seven dots and make sure I connect the right ones, you know? And <laughs> Yeah, I'm also not sure where the notion of angle comes in in the the Fano plane. I don't think like, it does. I don't think angle and distance come into that uh, that plane. Okay. Like I know you don't necessarily need those things in a geometry, um, and I guess specifically in a finite geometry, maybe you never have them really. Hmm. So did like when Greg was talking about all this at the stand up, did he have like was he doodling or did he have slides or even like did he write text or anything or was it all like dictation? No, he, he only had one slide and I showed that slide earlier. Uh, let me go back to it. This one. The one the one right there. Okay, this is Greg. Can you make that bigger? But also with uh, with uh, rolling code. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's rolling code underneath it. Let me see if I can figure out how to get that. Just click uh, on it. Yeah, if you click on it, it'll go full screen or bigger at least. Yeah, that was a screenshot I did. Um, okay. 
So he's labeled the points and lines. I guess we've seen that much already. Uh, yeah, but he did that for the encoding and rolling that's below. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. Let me let me sure. pull up that video and. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I, did, I didn't realize that was the only slide that he showed. I, I got maybe 15 minutes into the video, um, but it, you know, and he was still on the same slide, but it's uh, surprising to hear that was the only one. So he represented uh, each line with different uh, rolling term. Mm. And because there are red access, if if you have some com event, you will change from final plane to something else. Or well, I think the point was you would change from the final plane back to the final plane. So how is this related to the uh, uh, the book um, picturing? Quantum processes. Not familiar with that book. Yeah, he mentioned that book in in the in the Casper stand up. Oh, okay. Uh, what? Yeah, I, I can't remember. Capital P's and capital Q's. And this is from uh, Bob Cocke, or. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. Uh, picture, yeah, you're right. That, that's Bob Kuka, or however it's pronounced. Yeah, that's sure. But Isaac, you mentioned the, all of these uh, uh, terms are like... Uh, uh, Sorry. Like uh, choices, right? Yeah. So... Yeah, they're choices, but uh, from my perspective, it doesn't seem like there's much rhyme or reason as to how you're choosing if it's, you know, consumes or produces. It just seems fairly arbitrary. Because like uh, line one, you know, uh, the, the red expression that corresponds to this P1 is like a choice of two consumes. But on line three, the red expression is a, a choice of two produces. And on line yeah. four, it's a, it's a produce and a consume. He said that uh, there is four combination, if I remember. Yeah, That's and two of them different. are the same. I mean, if you have a, a produce and a consume as your choices, well, you know, it doesn't matter which order you do those in. I was just going to ask about ordering. Um, like, if I were doing regular Euclidean geometry and talking about a line and like traversing the points in that line, I could, well, oh, well, that's actually kind of weird. What I was going to say is like, I could tell you an ordering or I could at least tell you like this point, I, you know, if I start at some particular point and walk down the line, like I would encounter point X before point Y or, or something like that, right? You can always say that when you're walking on a line. Um, can you say that here? Like if I start at P1 and walk along L1, does it make sense to say I'll encounter P2 and then if I keep walking, I'll encounter P3? Or are they, is it more like a set? I don't know. I think it's more like a set. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you have that notion of direction, really. Yeah, like the, the circular one in the middle, no one said anything about it being special or different than the other ones, and it sure doesn't seem like it has a, an order or like endpoints or anything. Uh, Thomas Love, was this the only screen he showed? I'm, I'm start, I'm, I, I thought he showed a screen where there were some directions on the lines. Mm, I'm not sure. I don't remember something else. Yeah, it looks like the same screen all the way through. Yeah, but there, there is there is a like X one two uh, yeah. on, on the first line, but 
What? This is not the line, right? Uh, one, two, between P1 and P2. This is not the line. Or... Mm. So, oh, each color is, is a point, right? Yeah, yeah, like that red expression, not red X, mm -hmm. but that red expression, the red choice corresponds to P1, as far as I understood what he was saying. So one, and then like the yellow is P2 and the green is P3. That's why it's described sort of, you know, is the representation of that line a one. So each choice is a point. Yeah, right. Point. So what yep. does it mean, one, two? One, uh, six, one, no, notice that uh, I just I just throw this in there. Look at the number of slides along the left column that he's pulling this this diagram from. From he this is from a, a long paper. It looks like. Yeah, he said it was unpublished work, so I don't know if we can find that paper. Yeah, no, I don't think Ooh. I don't think it's available yet. You could ask him for it. I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> All right, so does this make sense? So the way I understood it was like the the points were being represented by uh, reduction expressions. So is the reduction expression that represents the point P1, like this red choice on L1, the red choice for L3, and the red choice for L4, like all of those in parallel are really this point P1, I'm assuming. Uh, wait, okay, say, say it one more time. P1. Yeah, so, so the red point P1, I'm mm -hmm. saying, is represented by the red choice in L1, the red choice in L3, and the red choice in L4. Because P1 lies on all three of those lines. And so all three of these uh, expressions somehow are representing like a piece of this point. So what I'm saying is altogether, this point P1 is represented by that, that red choice in par, you know, for L1, in par with the red choice for L3, in par with the red choice from L4. And that's what he means by it's a reduction expression, because now we actually have sends and receives that can reduce. So, okay. So like each, each line only has partial information about the point, I guess, is what I'm saying. Or what I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Like, I'm just trying to think through that a little bit. So, like, I'm just noticing, like, in the line, the very first line for L1, yeah, it's, like, yeah. channels X1, 3, and X1, 4. Right. Um. I wonder what that means. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, okay. One way to think of P1 is that it's the intersection between line lines one and lines, line one and line three. Another way is to think of it as the intersection between line one and line four. And a third way is to think of it as the intersection between line three and line four. Mm. Oh, you think that's where he's getting the indices on the names? That's what I just what I just wondered, but I don't see any red stuff that uses the sub. Oh yeah, I do. X four three comes up there a lot. Oh okay, so in line one he uses X one three and X one four, so one appears both times. In oh wow, interesting. So I think here's a hypothesis: the way he's naming his channels, there might be like additional name equivalents we need to consider. Like I wonder if. X13 is actually the same line as X14. Or sorry, no, 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 that's not what I meant to say. I wonder if X13 is the, the same channel as X31, like if you just reverse the order of the subscripts. Mm. Mm. Do you see in, anywhere uh, this X31? No, I don't. Well, I only looked at the red ones. I don't think there's an X31. Yeah. 
it's an X32. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here are just some other observations I'm making. I don't know if they mean anything. Whenever there's sends, whenever it's like X something send Q something, the, the subscripts on the process that's being sent are always the same as the subscripts on the channel on which it's being sent. Oh, and that's true for receives too. Oh yeah, this, uh, in, in any term, the subscripts are always the same. See, I was thinking that uh, this name X13 could only uh, communicate with X13 because, like, we have a, a receive on X13 for in L1, and then we have a send on X13 in L3. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, interesting. So you're always receiving if the line index, so like for line one, L1, uh, I only looked at the red um, expressions, but line one, uh, your, do, you, your name is X13 and you receive. So because one came first, you're receiving. Same thing with the X14. Mm -hmm. But in line three, you have X13. And since three came second, you're sending same thing. So I don't know if that's why we chose X43 as opposed to X34 here. I'm not really sure. What, what was the first part of the observation, Isaac? In so line, if, if yeah. the line index is the second index number in the name, you're receiving oh. or you're sending on the name. And if it's the first one, then you're receiving on the name. Okay, so like in line one, we're, since we're talking about line one, the index one has this sort of like special position within this line, and it comes yeah. first in both of the red terms, and so we receive on yeah. both of them. Yeah. And then in line, line three, now three is the special one, and it comes second in both cases, so we send on both of them. Yes. And then in line four, four is the special one, and at first it comes second, so we send, but in then in this, the second half of that choice, still only looking at the red part, four comes yes. first, and so we receive. Yes. Okay. Uh, I see. That, that, looks, that looks consistent with all of them. Yeah. And I, I also just noticed something else. This I feel stupid saying this now. You guys might have noticed it already, but just in case not, like line L1, uh, for example, every, every line has exactly three points. So there's exactly three choices parred together that correspond to those three points. Yeah. I just noticed yeah. that. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because there's like three ways to write all of the possible choices for each one of these uh, choices that we're writing. Because, you know, if you're, if the things you have uh, control over are whether they're both sends or both receives or one is a send and one is a receive, but you're using all of the same names and processes, then those are the choices you have. And so you're seeing all the combinations for each of them. I'm just not sure why the ind ind uh, indices are the way they are, but maybe it wouldn't even matter. Like if, uh, if for line three, we had an X13 and an X34, I, I think we would still see um, the mixing, but I'm not really sure. So it, it, I just now also noticed this is not about his encoding, but just about the Fano plane. There are no lines that don't in, intersect, right? Every line intersects every other line. Yeah. Uh, but I yeah. don't think I don't think w we have a uh, I don't think the the Fano plane introduces the the concept of intersection. Oh, I thought it said every point lies on the intersection of two lines. What can we, does anybody have the axioms handy again? I can, I can go back to it. Yeah, axiom five is each two lines have at least one point on both of them. Oh yeah, so that does say that every pair of lines intersects. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's at least one point incident with any two distinct lines. 
I guess maybe that's the same thing. Yeah. Hmm. So in the encoding, it seems like in the encoding, then it's the case that if you par any two lines together, um, then you're going to have a reduction. Yeah. And, uh, oh, is it deterministic? Are there any non-deterministic reductions? Uh, yeah, I think there have to be. Oh, wait, actually, I don't know. So like if we just par together line one and line two, it's going to be green stuff that comms, and it looks like it's going to be X12 that's chosen in both cases. Yeah, I think because you're, you're labeling with these line indices in some way, um, and so you're only ever going to have uh, two of them that are the same. Not really sure what the consequence of that is, but. Oh, you know what else I just noticed? At the very bottom, he wrote that the Fano equals all of these lines parred together. Yeah. I wonder if that has multiple valid reductions. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because, like, the red expression can, well, I don't know. Oh, or I guess, yeah, I guess it definitely has multiple valid paths of reductions, like just because you can do this one first, then that one first. But I guess maybe what I was trying to ask is like, I wonder if it has multiple valid fully reduced end states. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot. Of, I don't know if my whiteboard's big enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that you can reduce for example, receive in the, in the first line, uh, the, the green part, mm -hmm. uh, x1, 2, and uh, in the second line, the, the green part. Yeah, right. right. But they're, they're like choices. Can we just, you know, uh, reduce them? Or? I think even if you just look at one color of choice, you see that there's multiple possibilities for the output. Just uh, because like, so if you just look at the red choices all in parallel with one another, um, so you can either have a reduction on channel X13 or X14 or X43, right? And all of those processes that are connected to them, we don't even know their relationship to one another. Like maybe they're just all different. Hmm. And any one of those can come out. And if they're different, well then all of those reductions are different. Mm, yeah. Wait, what, what was that? So there are three valuations of just the red expressions. So you're sa just before you go further, yeah. though, you're saying the setup is like you're powering all of these lines all together and then saying, like, let's just focus. Like, there's tons of comms that can happen there. Let's just focus yeah. our attention on the red ones. Yeah, but only only red can reduce with red. And right. you know, only only the same color can reduce with that color because the the yeah. names. I'm assuming all of these names are distinct if the indices yeah. are. Distinct. Um, yeah. But then I'm also assuming that all of the processes are distinct if their indices are distinct. Um. And so then you know you can have a com event on channel X13 or X14 or X43. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're all going to lead to something different, and they're all going to lead to something different that doesn't necessarily reduce any further or produce any, you know, it doesn't produce any more common events with any of the, the red stuff. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. You're answering my question about, like, when we fully reduce Fano, are there multiple yeah. valid end states? And so you're saying the answer yeah. is yes. Yeah, I think, I think there's three for each point. I agree. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. It's like point. three to seven. Your whiteboard probably isn't big enough for all those. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm def I definitely don't know what the uh, connection between a reduction of this Fano process is to anything else it, that we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. 
geometrically, what is the reduction? So if, yeah. okay, so like if we just do one of these reductions, like if, if we reduce like line one with line three, yeah. well like yeah. line one par line three and then we reduce it, it seems like when you do exactly two lines, then there's exactly one valid reduction. Yeah. And it would be in this case like, well, all the yellow and green stuff from L1 paired with all the purple and black stuff from L3 paired with like P13 substituting in all of the, you know, Q13s in place of the Y13s. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. At first, I wasn't realizing that there would still be something left over. Like that, I was just thinking it would be like the the yellow and green from line one left with the purple and black from line three, and that was it. But that's not really true. There's still some red stuff left over. Yeah, yeah. So Did anybody? Bs and Qs. Oh yeah, like what concrete terms are they? Yeah, I mean, are they represent something or, I mean. Yeah, maybe they're all phano planes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that fire and ice game, like P1 exactly. is the entire <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every vertex has a phano plane in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a question of worldview, and if you're one of those like cyclical worldview peoples, then it's that, or if you're more of a nihilist, then they're all just nil and it doesn't matter. <laughs> all of these points are half empty. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, I got to jump out. This was fun to think about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everybody. See you. Bye bye. Yeah, I got to run to. I, I got an errand. See you later, Gary. See you. Bye bye. Hey, wait a second, Tom. The slub. You have any test yeah. rev? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure. I think testnet is, is restarted or, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that okay. I have. I asked, uh, I guess not separate for some, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Jim, do you know uh, uh, something about this scattering amplitudes? The what? Uh, about this scattering amplitudes that Greg mentioned. No. Mm. Uh, in, in, in his in his talk, uh, 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 this Nima Ahmed or something, uh, he was also talking about uh, this anti de Sitter space. So I was thinking maybe maybe <laughs> this is somehow related what you are uh, talking about. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's um, you know emergent geometry stuff. The um, uh, anti de Sitter space is really uh, defines a locality or defines an environment of a locality. Right? So, what does it mean to define an environment of a locality? Are you, are you implying some kind of it's geometry or? It defines a distance, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, a metric associated with it. So we, we can say amplitude or. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, but you know, in terms of defining distance, the 
yeah, well, you when know. You, when, when you, if you consider the ante, the center space, you're, you're, you're saying, you're talking about everything that's distant. Mm. So that's the environment. But you're not saying anything about geometry. You, you're, I mean, when you're saying the distance, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I usually think about <clears throat> some kind of geometry, but yeah, m maybe you don't have to, right? Antidote is an actively symmetric Lorentzian manifold with constant negative scalar curvature. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. Hmm. Well, uh, what an anti well, n dimensional anti de Sitter space is a maximally symmetric Lorentzian manifold with constant negative scalar curvature. Oof. I see. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what the maximally symmetric part means. Uh, I'm also not 100% sure what Lorentzian means, but I am assuming it's the metric that's associated with the manifold. But, uh, you know, manifold is like a, a space that is locally homeomorphic to Euclidean space. So like if you're talking about n-dimensional manifolds, this is something where you take a point from the, the space that we're talking about, the manifolds, and there exists some open neighborhood of that point. So like a small open sphere uh, ball really um, that is locally homeomorphic to Euclidean space. And by that, it means that there's a one-to-one -one continuous with continuous inverse mapping between that small, you know, sphere, whatever that means in, in that metric uh, to a Euclidean sphere. And uh, there, like, manifold is something like, I, it's not infinite, right? But it, they you can't, said, yeah. Most of okay. them, most of them are, unless it specifically says it's a compact manifold. It's it's infinite or a manifold with boundary. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but like for example, I mean, Euclidean space is a manifold, right? Like the where the where the local homeomorphisms are just the identity map. Right, identity is its own inverse, and a neighborhood is like a open ball, and you just map it to the same open ball. Mm, okay. Okay, so um, we consider a black hole. Mm -hmm. We have uh, three dimensions, space dimensions on the outside, and a time dimension, mm -hmm. and on the inside. We have three dimensions, but one of them is the time dimension outside. When you um, say inside, you mean on the surface? I'm sorry? When you say inside a black hole, you mean on the surface? No, I don't mean on the surface. <laughs> What is inside? They're, 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 they're finally realizing that black holes are huge inside. Well, sure, it's a portal to another universe. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. it, are, you, are you saying that there is some kind of information? But you're not saying that information is uh, on, the, on the space, right? Information is still on the surface, or? You're muted, Jim. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, 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 sort of the uh, the the uh, the universe is organized so that the atoms have inner dimension and the black holes have inner dimensions, um, and then uh, there's uh, the three dimensions, and then 
there's uh, uh, we're inside uh, 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 another three dimension, so to speak. Um, so we have uh, 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 time and space dimensions where each realm has exactly three space dimensions because that's what's required uh, to represent any graph is three dimensions. Um, and that's so. Uh, 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 and that's sort of the way that the quantum cause, uh, causality works. If it can, it, if it can go into three dimensions, it's space. If it can't, then it's time or perceived as time. I don't know. I, I'm uh, very much interested in this picturing quantum processes stuff next week maybe if, uh, sure. if uh, you guys are interested in that yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it, there's uh, uh, mm. um, and, and, and maybe this maybe we can take a look in this quantum uh, teleportation I mean I <laughs> I'm not sure how to interpret this that's a big one. Yeah, just entanglement in general. I don't, you know, I guess this is the shorter one. Computation resources. Spiders, I thought were classical. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what I'm looking at here, but. I mean, this, this guy, Bob Koke, he, he said that uh, he can uh, teach quantum mechanics to, you know, to, 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 to children. So, <laughs> this was if, if children can understand. So, can be. Herman would summarize the popular attitude towards quantum theory as shut up and calculate, which I guess was from Feynman, really. We suggest a different slogan, shut up and contemplate. So it would be interesting if uh, we could figure out what they're what they're talking about here. <laughs> you contemplate. I mean, that's sort of my philosophy, but I don't know how to relate it to these pictures so much. But uh, I'm gonna. I I, I I remember that these uh, uh, triangles, uh, they are like input or output. If if you know, you know like creating a variable is uh, so a, a, everything is looked uh, from the bottom. So variable is upside upside down triangle, right? Th these are like functions. And triangles are like introduction to something or, yeah. or hmm. so he starts out with processes diagrams. And then in chapter two is this string the book? diagrams. Oh well, let me uh are we looking at the book right now? Um I don't know exactly. Um it looks like um so at least the diagrams from the book. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, yeah, is this, this is not the book? There, yeah, I, I don't see, uh, there's no, no, there's no narrative in here. Yeah, I was going to say, this is a weird book. So this is, uh, <laughs> there are a bunch of slides. Yeah, oh, I think okay. I've seen the same. Okay, so if, if we, it's a presentation, really, because if we go side by side, we'll see they, you know, they, mm -hmm. mm, yeah, so it's, it looks like presentation of the whole book. Oh, cool. 
unless this is so it has a huge number of slides. Yeah, yeah. Over space from diagram. So let me uh this is Bob.pdf, huh? Must be uh that Bob guy. Yeah, and his talks are, are like very interesting and, you know. Oh, uh. So I'm gonna, do, I think as I'm gonna, I'm gonna take off and if there's nothing else, I guess. Uh, All right. Yeah, we should probably get to work. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you guys. Glad uh, you glad you came. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll. Uh, It would be great. Uh, it would be really, really great if uh, if uh, we can figure out something about these uh, uh, about these uh, quantum quantum contemplations. <laughs> quantum processing doubling. Chapter four. Uh, maybe we can, uh, Isaac, maybe we can picture uh, like POS in, in this way, so. <laughs> yeah, oh, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> need, well, to, uh, need to understand this. Obser theorem, observing is not a quantum process. Huh? What does observing mean? I guess uh, or maybe a better question is how does observing an interaction differ from one another? Yeah, this is weird. Is quantum measurement weird? Observing is not a quantum process. Conditions can only hold for orthogonal states. Um, Do we have a notion of orthogonality of states uh, for for rolling? We should. This maybe if the the same channels aren't ever implemented, maybe that's orthogonal. I don't know. Yeah, I guess maybe you do. Maybe you get it for free when you have behavioral types. I mean, logically, we, we have true and false, right? Like top and bottom or... Mm, yeah. Is... Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. All right, guys, I think I'm gonna head out here. All right, later. Yeah, take See it you next time. Yeah.